My name is Lisa. I'm your moderator for this session. I'm a community development officer at the Island Institute, but you're not here for me. You are here for our fantastic panel. Um, so I'm going to let our panelists introduce themselves and ask them to introduce themselves, their organization or their business, and also to share with us what they are most excited about in the creative economy at this moment. Um, and try to keep it to 90 seconds, but I'm gonna hold, not hold you right to it. Um, and Alexis, if you could kick us off and then popcorn it to any one of the other panelists. All right. <laughs> um, you hear me okay, yes? Okay, great. Um, so thank you so much for having me today. Uh, my name is Alexis Yamarito, and I am primarily here presenting um, as an independent interdisciplinary artist uh, with a community-based practice here in Rockland. So I'll, you know, uh, I'll speak a little bit about the collaborations that I um, support and work with. Um, and I would just say that what I'm most excited about is um, really the, the level of collaboration now that I'm experiencing having been based in the same community for about coming up on 10 years. So really excited about collaboration and um, I'll say more later. And let's go to Kim. Hi, everyone. And thank you, Island Institute, for inviting all of us here, um, myself included today. So I do a number of things. And this might actually be a theme topic of discussion for our creative economy discussion today. Uh, I'm an in independent artist. I um, upcycle plastic into sculpture these days. I also teach creative and professional development workshops and courses. I mentor artists one-on-one -on -one where I help artists strive to reach for the next level and to make a life making art, which unfortunately doesn't get taught um, during a BFA or an MFA program as much as it needs to be. Um, I work with high-risk youth. I organize the Rockland Sculpture Race every summer. Uh, and what I'm most excited about is uh, that, uh, like Alexis, I have seen a lot of collaboration in the Midcoast community. And um, especially during the pandemic, it seems that people are making a concerted effort to come together and creatives are making a concerted effort to come together to collaborate and join forces and exchange. So the, um, the period of time when we've been in isolation has kind of driven us out with vigor to work with others. So I'm actually seeing um, exciting opportunities and projects happen as a result of that. Oh, and let's see, um, who shall, Aiden, I'm gonna popcorn it over to Aiden. Sure, hi. Um, my name is Aiden Frazier. Um, I work um, out of Portland as a ceramicist, and I recently started my own ceramics business called Luster Hustler Ceramics. Um, I'm really excited to be chatting with you all. Um, my ceramics business uh, tagline is ceramics for self-love. Um, I make both thrown and hand-built functional wear surrounded by the women's form and the women's body. Um, to just support and represent um, a healthy, caring, appreciative view on women's bodies, um, supporting the body positivity movement. Um, I just began my business uh, about a year, almost a year ago, November 1st will be a year. Um, and I've had a multitude of mentors in many different um, times in my life and different aspects as well. Um, all all in the creative economy. So um, it's really no surprise that I started my own ceramics business and I'm enjoying it so much. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the short of that. Um, I will pass this on to Catherine. Oh, you're um, muted. Has to happen at least once, right? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Catherine McCletchy. I started a small business called The Good Supply nine years ago, and I have been able to 
I put a call to artisans out in 2012 into sort of the mid coast area and we've grown from representing 16 artists to about 100 artists and small businesses in Maine. And the neat thing about it is, um, or one thing I'm so excited about is like the public seems to really be catching on. We've, there's always been a really great um, support for the creative community by other creatives, but I feel like there's something a little more mainstream that's happening right now. And um, one thing that I do with the artists I work with, and then also with the collectors who are working with us is sort of encourage people to follow intuition. You know, I think that creativity is an intrinsic human value and it's something that was sort of demoted um, by society, maybe in the 90s, I don't know, maybe it started happening a long time ago, but uh, it's something that's a part of us. And um, I think it's neat that we're all remembering something we already know, you know, it's in us. Um, who can I pass this, pass the mic to? Let's see. Bill is our last one to give an introduction. Nice. Unless, Bill, do you prefer William? Bill is just fine. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Bill Travaskis. I am a K-12, pre-K-12 music teacher uh, on Vinyl Haven at the Vinyl Haven School. Uh, I'm also an independent artist, composer, um, sound engineer, sound designer, whatever, photographer. Um, and I think uh, probably what I'm most excited about Mo for the for the last few years, seeing how my students could actually look at the arts as a way um, forward in a career path and becoming interested in it beyond the classroom and uh, seeing it as a way of maybe making some money and um, venturing out of their comfort zone a little bit. I think that's really um, it's been a neat process to see see that evolve just in the last couple of years, especially during this whole um, pandemic. Thank you. Well, thank you all for introducing yourselves. I'm really looking forward to hearing what other words you have to share with us the rest of our hour together. And I'm gonna ask Kim and Aiden to kick us off with our first question, um, asking you, what has your experience with mentoring been? Did you have a mentor? Have you been a mentor for others? Um, yeah, and Kim, if you want to start us off. And sure. Follow. Well, um, I am a mentor and I mentor artists regularly. So that usually looks like a conversation that takes place monthly uh, over the phone. And I work with artists from wherever they're at to uh, move steadily towards their goals and to break that into incremental stages, small tasks that are um, that can be accomplished. And one of the reasons that I started doing this is I recognized the need and also recognized that I really could have used a mentor. I think everyone could use a mentor at every stage of the game, someone who knows more than they do has experienced it, has made the mistakes for themselves that can save you a lot of time and trouble and make the mistakes yourself. <laughs> um, I feel like I've, I've learned by doing it wrong two or three times and why not pass that on to someone else so they don't have to make, do it wrong two or three times as well. Um, so I wish that I had a mentor and I would encourage emerging artists to any or any artist to anytime there is someone who they identify with that can help them along on their creative path to at least reach out and see if there might be an opportunity to be mentored by that person or at least um, have a chance to sit down with them and ask them some questions to not let those opportunities pass when you um, meet someone who you identify with, who you feel could, um, you could learn something from. Most artists that are more mature and have, um, had success, uh, if they have the time, are most of them are willing to share at least some, or you know, give some resources at least. 
So my advice would be to take advantage of the opportunities when they come your way. I really get a lot of satisfaction personally out of working with um, emerging artists, uh, creative people to bring them along and see that they can um, do things that they didn't think they would, could or that uh, they could overcome fear and you know have success. Like that's so, uh, that I, I get a lot of gratification in sharing in that success with them. So I take, um, you know, I just think that that's a win-win situation. How about you, Aiden? Um, I've had many different mentors in my life um, in the creative realm. Um, I haven't yet been a mentor myself, but through my experience, I actually um, really look forward to someday being able to be a mentor, whether that be just in a very casual manner or um, something like the Main Craft Association's apprenticeship program that I actually just finished last weekend um, with Tim Christensen, which was an awesome resource and a really valuable seven months of working um, with a really small community of artists under that grant um, that has allowed me to meet a much larger network of people in the creative economy. Um, I began with uh, my foot in the creative economy in high school um, with my teacher, Jonathan Mess, and um, now friend after I've been out of high school for a while now. Um, so he was my first sort of step into knowing a working artist and seeing how, you know, he was a teacher and an independent artist. That was a, you know, a new idea for me. Um, through Jonathan Mess, I met Catherine and worked at the Good Supply in high school and still on and off to this day. Um, and in that setting, I learned um, the multitude of arts that are right in Maine, right in my backyard, um, basically. Um, so through Catherine, I was able to learn the retail side of art, um, how to build relationships with artists in a business setting, um, how to, run a, how to run a small shop, um, how to make it look pretty and how to have a good time and be respectful while doing that. Um, I still you know, uh, refer back to the lessons that I learned there today running my own business. Um, and from then I worked as a studio assistant for a few different artists um, in the Midcoast area. Currently I work for um, a Slipcast production ceramicist who's teaching me all about that world of ceramics, which is unlike my own um, work and unlike Tim Christensen's work as well, that um, whose work I became very familiar with over this mentor process. So um, I feel extremely grateful for having, you know, put myself out there um, in this community to get these mentors. I really don't, I wouldn't have any idea what I was doing without these experiences. Um, and I think in the creative world, um, having mentors is particularly important because of how diverse this field is and how personal um, and varying the paths are to their careers. I think working one-on-one -on -one with a more mature artist or someone who's doing something similar than you, uh, similar to you, um, just is really beneficial um, in this sort of like multifaceted never endingly diverse uh, you know, economy that I find myself in now. So um, yeah, that's my experience. Thank you, Aiden and Kim for sharing your, your mentorship stories and continuing mentorship stories. Um, the next question um, is for Bill and Alexis. So Alexis, you already alluded to this a little bit in your introduction, um, but would like you to share what connections or collaborations exist between educators and leaders in the creative economy. And what would you like to see as far as connections or collaborations? And feel free to include anything around mentorship specifically. Bill, if you want to start us off. Sure, I'll start us off. Thanks. Um, let's see, I, that's a great question. Um, I think that the opportunities that offer students and uh, mentees the ability to experience whatever the real thing might be that they could be studying or that they could even be interested in um, is 
kind of a good first step. You know, I'm, I'm not really thinking of like internships or anything like that, but just getting, getting students um, or mentees into the real world of whatever it is they're working on. Um, and I think, so for example, I had um, a group of students who, you know, we do school concerts and things like that, but we were given an opportunity to go actually perform at a local venue uh, as a class, as a, you know, a group of um, students, not as like a band or a working, you know, group of professional musicians, but they got to experience the real life, um, uh, you know, way that works. And I feel like that was in the one hour that we did that, that was a more valuable experience that they might not have uh, received had we not had that opportunity. So um, it was uh, so different from being in the classroom and so different from, um, you know, studying something academically. It was just doing it. And I guess for me, being that hands-on is kind of the way I, I like to work. And I like to work that way with, with my students. Um, yeah, I think I think getting out there and doing the thing is really important and failing. Very important too. <laughs> Bill, can I ask how that connection got set up? Was that something you sought out? Was that something the business was interested in? Well, like everything on Vinyl Haven, you know, everyone's connected in some way. So I do uh, sound engineering at this new venue here on Vinyl Haven called Skull, and it's sort of a speakeasy slash music venue. Now it's not a, that doesn't sound like a place you would want eighth graders or seventh graders to go hang out. Um, but it does, it is actually, it's a great place for them to go hang out and experience this stuff. Um, so I, since I work there and I know the owner uh, very well, and you know, um, we kind of, we kind of just, we, we did it a couple of years ago before the pandemic world happened. And um, we were able to do it at the beginning of the summer, sort of end of the school year. And that's really how it happened. I, I did I did have a, a lot of kids come join and help really set up things too, you know, like learn how to plug a microphone in. That was really important. Thank you. Alexis? Sure. Uh, let's see. So the, the first thing that I would highlight or um, is here in the in the mid coast, and Kim is a part of this alliance too. So if you want to speak to this at all as well. Um, I think, you know, some of the existing connections and collaborations that we have here, you know, kind of through the, uh, the school district here in Rockland, but also like all the arts organizations and uh, youth providers and uh, healthy human resources, there's like this really active alliance, um, we call ourselves the RSC 13 Youth Alliance. And so I think, you know, some of the ways that the connections get made are more organic when a particular project arises, like, you know, for instance, I, I show up to that alliance wearing a few hats. So I wear at the Alliance meetings, I wear a hat, which is um, I'm one part of the teaching team at the Center for Maine Contemporary Art. So I am, I lead the uh, community art programs and the high school teen mentorship program at the CMCA's art lab. So I show up to the Alliance meetings wearing, you know, that those two, actually two hats for the CMCA. And then I also show up to that meeting um, as, you know, an independent uh, mural artist, you know, someone who is seeking and finding opportunities, you know, um, to create, you know, public art throughout the state. So like, if I hear about something that might feel like a good fit for something even beyond the area, I might sometimes bring that up as like a field trip or an excursion or something pre-COVID. Um, and then I also show up to that meeting wearing a hat, which is I'm the, the mural director for the Arts in Action Community Mural Program in Rockland. So, uh, you know, I think a lot of it is like showing up with this like kind of integrated self to find the connection so that like, I'll show up to meetings or to, um, yeah, mostly meetings. We attend a lot of meetings. Uh, and it's basically saying like, okay, what's the kind of expansive, like how fully can I present myself in various settings so that I can be more inclusive to incoming collaborations, right? Um, or to kind of uh, also to scale the things that I say yes to, to say like, oh, I might not say yes to this independently, but if I say yes to this through the support that I have through a huge nonprofit art center, well, so huge, but like a sense like kind of the scale of the commitment that I can give based on the, the collaborations. Um, and I would say too that the uh, another way that you know educators can become you know maybe connected uh, you know through creative economy is I think like Bill is speaking to uh, really finding essentially like 
yeah, the real life experience and, and something that I'm really driven by in my work is like paid internship opportunities or at least paid stipends for youth so that uh, when I, I work so much with youth, uh, just trying to find ways for educators to know like, okay, this is an organization or a person who's willing to support someone or uh, lead them towards like more like a workforce development kind of opportunity and then connect those quickly because I think that's a more viable way for a lot of people to find their way into creative economies to feel like it's a sustainable way to make a living. So that's something that I'm always looking out for. And that's most of my, I would say that's my work through the Oceanside High School. I stay very connected to their art department to sort of keep my feelers out for paid internships or unpaid internships that would give them experience for school or for other job pathways. Thank you. And Catherine and Bill, what are opportunities you see for leadership and growth in this sector? And Catherine, since we haven't heard your voice yet, if you are ready to hop in. I mean, excuse me, I, you know, I think the word that came to mind was bravery. And I think that's where this panel and group coming together is really important is so many people need encouragement. You know, they're feeling inclined to make these connections. They, um, their hearts are sort of telling them where their paths could be. And again, I think something happened in our culture where we were taught to shut that down or it that, you know, not to value that. And, you know, sometimes that call to action from yourself is so strong that you just must pursue it. But I think, especially with younger people, they're so impressionable and our lessons in society are so strong and what we know through the media, which I think one of the messages is so few people succeed, um, those are false. And it doesn't have to be like that. And I think that's a real strength of being in the mid coast region and in Maine in general, what I've heard from so many people visiting from out of state is that the concentration of creative people here sort of pursuing their paths is so great that there's almost this um, or, you know, the energy begets energy, you know, we're all sort of fueling ourselves off of each other. And that's where when Kim and Alexis both mentioned collaboration, it's like united we stand. And um, because that is a strength for Maine in particular, I think this idea of having welcoming outside economy into the state is important. So let's start all the small businesses. Let's have this money flowing from, you know, outside of the state of Maine into Maine. And the more we see um, success, you know, it's so interesting, reinforcing success, having this positive reinforcement is so good for all of us that, um, you know, it's just going to encourage more people to follow their creativity and to know, again, like Alexis was say, saying, this um, sustainable way to make a living is real. It exists. We can tap into it. So I think um, in terms of leadership, I would say words like encouragement and bravery, you know, just do it, like jump in, start small, but um, I think with all of us here, we know, or this is it, the leadership part is happening with this conversation. Do you see ways that we can, as a greater community, start flipping that message? I do. Um, I think that media is a huge, um, you know, place where that positive reinforcement can happen. And we are so lucky in Lincoln County, the Lincoln County News is just very generous with their arts coverage. I think with the, um, all of the art walks that are happening, the greater community organization where the public is invited to participate and inclusivity is a focus. I think that's, that's how to flip it by inviting everybody to the art party. 
I want to come. I'll come to the art party. <laughs> I like to say I, I surround myself by artists, even though I'm not one myself. Um, Bill, what do you see the opportunities for leadership and growth in this sector? Um, well, I think everything Catherine said is so good, you know, like jumping in and kind of not being afraid to mess it up. And I, you see that as a teacher, you see certain ages of students who, I mean, they just do that. And then they reach a certain point, 13 years old, 14, the self-consciousness just like explodes out of them. And they real suddenly realize everyone's staring at them. And then you have to work your way back to a point that you can feel comfortable putting yourself out there again. And the message should be, uh, you know, it's okay to fail even in the public eye. <laughs> you know, if you're trying to make something and you're trying to do something creative, um, your, your mentors around you should be uh, willing to not only help you there, but also help you when you fall down and it doesn't happen, you know, or it doesn't work out the way you planned it. I mean, every artist has a situation where they sit down to create something or, you know, they have the intention to make one thing and then it turns around. Maybe it's a complete failure. I just had this experience this week, by the way, which is why I'm speaking from a lot of experience. You completely fail. You feel like crap. You can't sleep. And then you you sort of give yourself a, a, a break and then you come back to that sort of thing. And there's a resiliency in that. I'm not saying I'm the most resilient person in the world, but I think we can build resiliency in, in younger people as leaders. That's a really big opportunity for us as mentors to put forward to, and let, let people see you fail. I mean, we just got all this new technology in our school and fumbling around with it and watching my students say, okay, boomer to me, even though I'm not a boomer. Um, you know, I, I don't mind that. They can see me fail all they want. I think that's good. I think it's good because then they feel okay about it. So um, in a way, I think that's, it's kind of a message to put out there um, uh, from a leadership perspective, maybe. Thank you. I like that changing the norm. Um, Aiden. What do you think artists and makers need most right now? Um, well, I think a little bit of what Catherine said and what Bill said, um, they need to see failure. They need to see like people that have made it, what it looks like on their day that they didn't make it. Um, I am lucky enough to have mentors to like bounce ideas off of and kind of use their failures um, towards my growth. So I think what creative people need right now is confidence, is accessibility to funds to help begin their career in art. Um, I think that the general message of like, if you want to be an artist, is that like, mm, that's a hard way to make a living. And like any small business you start is probably going to be kind of a hard way to make a living in the beginning, but that shouldn't stop you from doing it. Um, so I think that accessibility to financial help um, would be great. And I did see a lot of um, uh, like emergency funds available for artists during the quarantine, which I thought was really beautiful. Um, I was the recipient of one of those and it really made a huge difference. Um, it allowed me to buy clay and sit at home and like buy some tools and work from home while I wasn't allowed to leave. And um, it wasn't a lot of money, but it was enough to push me to begin. Um, and that was really pivotal for me. Um, so I think, yeah, like words of encouragement from, from business owners, from independent artists, uh, mentors of any kind that are currently in the field and have a name like hearing words of encouragement from them hearing their failure stories um success stories um knowing like how they got from point a to point b um like i've worked with artists who you know went to grad school got the degree and now they're a working artist um i've worked with artists who never went to any formal education and they're still a working artist and like i still look up to them the same and hearing their stories and seeing the variety in their stories really helps me kind of paint a much more open, welcoming,
picture for myself. Like I don't have to do this one way. And um, just having the support of this art community, specifically the ceramics community for me has been just incredible. Um, and it really makes me feel like I can do anything I want, or at least be able to bounce my crazy ideas off of someone. Um, so I think accessibility to funds, accessibility to people who are maybe looking to be a mentor um, or um, need, I don't know, part-time studio assistant or you know any positions that they might find themselves kind of mentoring someone. I think accessibility to those um, opportunities is important. Um, and yeah, just like words of encouragement from people who've like already made it would be like really great for people starting out, I think. So to Kim, Alexis, and Catherine, I'm curious um, how you've seen those networks and how to connect artists to mentors um, or how to connect interns or students who are looking to get exposure. Mm -hmm. or artist to artist because you know one artist has a resource that this other artist could really benefit from yeah well um one thing that i recognized right away in hearing aiden's approach was uh your willingness to stick your neck out there and introduce yourself and maybe offer to work for someone or you know try to connect more more build a network so starting with just showing up at openings, receptions, art events, introducing yourself, um, inviting someone to your studio for a studio visit, reciprocating that, um, you know, really being willing to put yourself out there and make connections, network, introduce, and not just in art circles, but in business circles and in the community circle and any circle. So, um, you know, if we, if we just stay, if our artists and creative people just stay amongst ourselves, uh, we're missing out on a lot of other opportunities that might lead us to, you know, an in, down an interesting road. Um, so, you know, just being willing to be the first one to, you know, say, hi, you know, my name's Kim Bernard blah, 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 what's yours, you know, being, being willing to just be out there. Yeah. I sort of, I second that because I think that participation, it's, you know, it's this idea of participate in the community you want to be a part of. So show up when the events are happening, when the institutions are having openings, show up and you could, you know, have little icebreaker comments. I love in the creative realm, you're like cool sneakers, you know, and then suddenly you have a best new best friend. But um, I also to recognizing and acknowledging that there's a sort of continuum. Uh, when I think about people who've become my mentors in my small business, it's because I asked and you know, you actually can't really just ask, hey, will you be my mentor? It rarely works out, but sometimes that is enough of an icebreaker to where the answer might initially be no, but over time, the relationship can organically develop. You know, there's, it's gotta be a good fit. And um, that continuing education element of it too has really helped me with that you know, trying to read a book a year that has to do with a different discipline related to my career is something that gave me the idea to even ask, you know, hey, will you work with us? And like I said, and sort of acknowledging these failures that we all have, um, the person I approached said no initially, but turns out that relationship has flourished beautifully over time. And so um, again, like Kim was saying, put yourself out there. Don't be afraid to ask. If you are afraid to ask, sometimes that's an indicator that it's like the brave leap that you're supposed to be making for self-actualization. Um, but again, this, this concept of continuum, 
I, I still have mentors. My mentors still have mentors. It's this beautiful teaching that can happen in a cyclical way, acknowledging that we all have a lot to learn from each other. Excuse me, Lisa, can you repeat the question? Because I became so engrossed in what the others were saying. Yeah, what is the question again? Um, opportunities to connect people looking for mentors or people who have resources, um, whether that be artist, artists, artists to, to businesses. For sure. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. Also, if you have any tips for introverts, and it doesn't have to be just you who answers that one. I guess just so that I can see we have more space for others and other questions to come up. Um, I think that uh, an effective way, or at least in, the, in recent years, something that has helped to build the connections, again, for particular job shadows or uh, introductions among youth and artists has been, um, so the Arts at Work program that I lead for the CMCA has been really based around this collaboration with the local high school, as I mentioned. And so something that we've done has been to do um, like a downtown tour of um, behind the scenes, like at CMCA, at the Farnsworth, in artist studios. And we were able to do this um, in November before uh, COVID shut down. So that was really, I mean, it's been a little while since we've done it um, as fully as we did, but I, I would say that this kind of like, kind of this idea of the gatekeeping, um, if you have access, if you know someone who will give you a tour, right? You then extend the invitation, you find all the connections that you can to make it so that someone who hasn't seen themselves in a particular setting can then physically be there, but also maybe hear about, um, you know, uh, how someone arrived at that work. So we, those are some effective ways, I think that, um, again, just being sure that when you do set up an introduction or uh, you're inviting people into a space that they haven't been invited to before, that you're also being like, this will be in, hopefully in an alienating experience. So being really mindful about how you make those introductions as an effective, um, you know, uh, I mean, some of that is mentorship, right? Because I'm also working with educators who maybe haven't done work in the um, with artist studios or with museums, right? So sort of always thinking about the collaborations are happening. Uh, sometimes it's spontaneous, but also you're like thinking, oh, I've known this person for a while. I've never seen them in this setting. So just being keeping that, um, I'm, I'm always kind of that kind of higher level thinking of like, Will people feel like they belong here? What could I do? What could I ask them ahead of a visit to make sure that even a teacher feels welcome? Um, those are some of the thoughts I have about that. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, and, uh, can, I, can I just tack on a little bit more to that last question? Sure, and so, then I know Catherine has something she wants to add. Great. So often artists are waiting to be invited and it's great when, in a hap when that happens, and I would encourage people to say yes when they're invited to you know, participate in a presentation or a studio visit or do a Pecha Kucha, even if they're a little intimidated by that. Um, but to say yes to those invitations, when you have way too many invitations later on, you can start being selective and say no, but say yes to everything in the beginning, even if you don't get paid. Uh, but also, if you're not being invited, plant a seed by saying, oh, I'd be interested in volunteering for you in your studio if you ever need an extra hand, like plant the seed that you would be willing to do that or go and volunteer at a museum or an art center or an opportunity that you would like to be involved with. So create your own opportunities, host a pop-up show of you and your friends work, hold an open studio. If you're not being invited into a gallery, host your own show, you know, create your own opportunity rather than just sitting and waiting for it to come to you, go to it. And, and I wanted to just add something a little less formal and, you know, that's social media. It's very, you know, a, it's a casual way to whisper in the ears of people you admire. So it can be very low key and under the radar, but I did go to Aiden's talk with um, Tim Christensen at Watershed Center for Ceramic Arts. And um, 
they connected over Instagram. So again, it's not that your message will be read every time, but it's just recognizing an unofficial pathway to the people who you admire and can learn something from. So it doesn't have to be a formal love letter over email, but you know, you can get the attention of people you'd like to that way. Thank you. And just a reminder to folks who are here, please feel free to add your, your questions, comments into the chat. Um, Bill, I'd like you to start us off with this next question. And then if anybody else wants to answer it after, um, you're more than welcome. Um, many of you, Bill included, you wear many hats and you are a creative in many different ways. Um, how do you find balance between these? How do you set boundaries? Um, both financially time wise just share your your creative process about your your multiple creative hats sure thanks for the question um it's hard you know and i i won't lie that like it's it can be very stressful when you're interested in a lot of things and that's that's okay um but like you said setting boundaries um is a thing you learn over time, or at least for me, I've learned it over time. I've learned to say no, uh, probably not as many times as I should in the last couple of years, but I still have learned to say no and sort of knowing your own limits too and what you wanna focus on. I think as artists, we get, uh, we get focused on certain things that we're really interested in for maybe even a short period of time. You know, Even if it's like a subset of what you're already doing, you're like, I'm really into this one, uh you know painting style i'm really into this one kind of music um and you get really focused on that and you kind of don't want to do anything else and that's okay i think it's okay to put other things on the back burner and allow yourself to focus on something new or different or revisit something that's old but uh i have to say i, I never really did put family before anything Thing else but I do now so to me that has become very important to have my family is like the the top of my list of you know everything I do and I know that sounds kind of cheesy but it's so true because um, once I once I feel at ease with my family and I'm in the company of people that I want to be in the company of all the time um, I my brain just opens up and I can actually think creatively um, Whereas if I'm not in that place, in that mindset, I'll just work and it'll be a cycle of failures maybe. So that's kind of, that's kind of where my, my thinking is at on this. And it's something that I definitely think about a lot, probably too much. How do I set my boundaries? <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, rings, rings true with me as well. I don't know if anybody else has has thoughts or wants to share their own process or how they set their own boundaries. Alexis, it's back to the failure thing. <laughs> I was going to share that part of you know part of how I manage my time, but like, like that's a whole nother art form unto itself. Like I love, I really embrace the idea of managing my own time so that I. Can, can be, you know, give more fully to others, know what I need for myself. And I think that, yeah, when you do, you know, and I think there's probably many people in the sitting at home, like folks that are listening, right? That you are, um, again, this idea that you are many things. So making time for those many things. But I think when, because I do so much youth mentorship, I'm really trying to maintain balance personally so that I can also hopefully, uh, you know, signal to them that you can, you can, you can have that <laughs> you don't have to people might sometimes say oh you seem so busy like you don't have any time for yourself and I say like oh my time for myself includes being in community and being you know with young people so like it's that idea of like really um just knowing uh again how do you best it's about time management but it's also that it's those things that really fill you up and um I think you know um Catherine mentioned it it's come up from a few others as well but just it's so much about supporting yourself um, with the community. So whether that's family or it's the teaching site or the you know um, projects, it's they should they should um, kind of interlock. And I think a lot of that just comes down to like knowing how much time you have. And that's something that if anybody would like to talk more about how to do that with high school students in particular, 
I love, I do a lot of block scheduling. I do a lot of like multicolored calendar, kind of like, how are you gonna get that project in kind of thing. So I have to do that for myself to kind of stay afloat. And so I try to do it very authentically <laughs> because otherwise I wouldn't be an honest mentor to the people I'm, I'm in those relationships with, right? I would add. I scheduling. forgot to mention. Yeah, Go ahead, sorry. Then. I was just going to say. Ahead. I forgot to mention. A, a, an accurate calendar is the key to a, yeah. a happy, creative life. Absolutely. <laughs> ditto. Ditto. Um, I would add to that scheduling your studio time, your creative time, your practice time, whatever your creative time looks like. That gets blocks in the calendar. I'm always surprised when I talk to an artist who just thinks that that happens whenever you feel like it. And every professional artist that I know schedules their creative time like a nine to five job so that they're sure that it happens and protects that um, vor voraciously. Uh, and um, I, so I read this, I was, when Bill mentioned, um, boundaries are something you learn over time that really resonated with me because it sort of tied back to the um like learning the growth mindset of learning from past failures so it's like oh that didn't work for me so i need to change my habits so i read once or last holiday season um, someone gifted me the busiest uh, woman's guide to self-care and I have never read a book like that, but it was a gift. And I cannot tell you, there's this one thing that stuck with me. And it is whenever you think you do not have time is exactly when you're supposed to do it. And so that I work really well with rules like that. So the minute I think like, oh, I don't have time to take a walk. I'm like, oh, there, that's my signal. It's time to go take a walk because I just identified to myself that I didn't have time, which means I really need to do this. And um, so I think that goes, that is like another touch point on intuition, you know, like we know, we hear that voice when we're about to overcommit or we have that feeling when something isn't right. And I think getting into a practice of recognizing it and then speaking up on behalf of your intuition to um, sort of do the right thing. Um, but it is, or everything everyone's contributed. I, I feel you, I hear all of that. And this is a question that's open to any anyone that feels called to respond. Um, can any of you speak more specifically to the ripple benefits the creative economy brings to Maine's overall economy and population? It's I'm one big that. mashup. It's all it's all one. <laughs> like it, it's in, I don't feel like we're separate at all. There's so many interwoven intersections, mashups that um, it's all connected, right? Like when I uh, place an order for art supplies, that is another kind of material that's being produced in industry, perhaps that, uh, you know, it's all um, printing invitations, like using the web, like we're, it's just one big gnarly web, I think. Um, the Center for Maine Tourism is, has been pretty great at recognizing how important the creative economy is to the state. Um, they have been um, funding different promotional videos and um, for businesses doing creative things, everything from uh, small businesses like the Good Supply to the craft brewery movement. And they've been broadcasting those promotional videos nationwide to sort of identify their create you know, our states, our community's creative identity. And I think the really neat thing that I talk to a lot of customers who come into our store 
is the artists here, the level, uh, the level at which the artists here are creating is world class. So in the sense of our institutions that offer international like residency programs, international artists seeking um, sort of career development will take their sabbaticals and do a workshop at or a residency program at the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship, Watershed Center for Ceramic Arts, Haystack Mountain School of Crafts. And the artists here are teaching at Penland School of Crafts. So we really, back to the gnarly web that Kim mentioned, it's like um, everyone knows that Maine has roots in the creative economy. And um, I'm excited to be a part of that, but also to have that awareness sort of growing again beyond just the creatives themselves and sort of becoming more known to the rest of the community and members of the state. I think one of the ways in which it um, has a ripple effect is that it, it sort of invites people from outside of Maine to work here, maybe even live here and work from here um, and bringing their experiences, their skills, their, um, their creative, you know, uh, blood to the state. And I don't know, you know, it, it makes me realize that when I first moved to the mid coast quite a while ago now, um, it felt like a different place. It felt like it was up and coming. And now it feels like, boom, it's pretty incredible how far we've come in 10 years. Um, I'm speaking specifically to the mid coast with so many people moving um, to the area because of the seed that was planted and that just sort of like innate uh, creative uh, juice we have flowing in this area. Um, but yeah, it does, it does feel like people are, people want to come here and work here and even hold residencies and things like that. It's, it's a very, um, it's a very cool thing. I think that that's a big ripple effect that maybe we'll hopefully see continue. Alexis, I saw your hand go up. Sure, I'm just, I'm so aware of us like becoming towards the end of the panel. I just want to say that the, maybe to continue this conversation beyond or if folks would like to connect further about this, I think that the, the more that the ripple, the ripple benefits are certainly there, but I'm also thinking very much of that like forward thinking around, we'll really know it's working when more people feel like they have meaningful work. So I feel like so much of our, our work uh, is, you know, like there's employment, there's industry, there's the like, uh, I guess I just still feel like I, it's, yes, we're working in these ways that are very exciting, but I, I'm thinking that it's just like, I, again, like it is, it's all wrapped up in, I think really community wellness. So when people feel like they have meaningful work, they have, you know, wages, sustainable, you know, secure housing, all so many things that are so, so um, pressing, right? Like, I know there's some other questions, but I just want to say, like, I think the ripple effects are there, but we're also like, it's still yet to be seen that how much and how wide that participation will be. Uh, yeah, that net is still being cast somehow in terms of people really benefiting from it. So it's like, let's all let's all stick with it. <laughs> um, and Kim and Aiden, if you wouldn't mind starting us off with what will likely be our, our last question of our panel. This has been such a joy, but we are at five minutes left. Um, can you speak to what some of the pitfalls of mentorship might be? Hmm. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Well, so there are an infinite number of views of what success can be based on individuals' idea, individual creative people's ideas about what their success is. So I think for an artist to um, be first asking themselves, what's my personal idea of success? And be really clear about in what direction an individual uh, artist wants to go. And hopefully being uh, paired with an artist mentor who is going to encourage that and not 
detour them based on their own ideas of success. So I, th I really feel that a big pitfall can be um, derailing a creative person um, because the artist, the mentor has like strong views, opinions, and not really listening to the emerging artists and guiding them in, in their personal direction and honoring their own individual path, even if they don't know what it is yet, but to help them find that direction. I think that that's a really great point. Um, oftentimes, I mean, most in most cases, mentors are looked up to by the mentee and um, looked at as someone who knows what they're doing. And you look to them for guidance and for resources and for help. Um, and I think in that way, um, the relationship can be maybe a bit uh, dangerous in a way that you, um, don't go with what you know you're really feeling because your mentor doesn't point you in that direction or um, maybe and this kind of goes back to um, thinking about boundaries um, maybe you take on too much maybe your mentor um, gives you so many opportunities that you spread yourself too thin and you feel um, sort of washed out by it all um, so I think that um, to be a good mentee, you need to have a sense of what you're doing there, what you want to learn, setting goals um, for yourself and for that relationship, I think um, is an important part of that. Um, whether you speak to your mentor about that at first or not, just as, as the artist yourself, like, you know, learn how to say no or kind of, um, realize things that you might not want to do or um it's a it's a balance between taking on opportunity and self-preservation and boundaries which as a creative and as a you know small business owner it's very hard to do um but um yeah i'd say maybe a pitfall is um the mentee like being um too, spread too thin or um, worked too long without pay or whatever for the experience, which is valuable in its own right, but um, people deserve to be paid uh, after a certain time for their work. Um, and even if you're still learning, you, you have valuable input that deserves to be listened to and um, compensated for. So, yeah. yeah. Well, a sincere Thank you and sending humble virtual gratitude out to each of you, Kim, Alexis, Bill, Aiden, and Catherine. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts, your wisdom, your experience with us in this past hour.